Hi everyone, and welcome to this next video in our mini control series. Um, what I would like to discuss in this video is the question of uh, feedback control. Right? So what we have seen until now was this, you know, after some steps and, and manipulations, we ended up uh, with a system description like this, if we have a linear dynamic system that we want to control. Right? So we have xk plus 1 is a times xk plus b times uk, and then we saw that we can reshape our control input into a very long vector and we can reshape the state into also a very long vector so state dimension times the number of time steps plus one for the states and times n for, for the input and then we had this objective function that we needed to minimize which was a very convenient way because this ended up in solving a linear system to give us the optimal control but importantly for the setting where we have a linear dynamic system and a quadratic cost function. Okay, and so what this actually is, is what we call open loop control. Because if you look at this, what we have is we have an initial condition, and only based on this initial condition, we are going to determine the optimal input over a given time horizon of length n. Right? And so this n can be very large, or in theory, this could even be infinity, right? If you look into a ongoing control problem, like stabilizing a process, a, a chemical process for instance, this is not necessarily an end time where you stop. Okay, And so what we have not discussed for now is the question of disturbances. Right. So all we have assumed is that we have a linear model and that this model is exact in terms of predicting our system. Right? And obviously, this is not always the case, right? We may have the problem that the system has small uh, insecurities in how we model it, right? So the A matrix may be different or the B matrix may be different. Or maybe, and we will discuss this in, in a lot more detail in the next video, we do not even have a linear system to begin with and our modeling decisions reside in a linear system. Altogether, this means that we have disturbances, meaning that our real system behaves differently to what our model will predict. And so what we uh, the, the issue we have that we run into is in this open loop setting, we diverge, okay? So we determine an optimal input given this model, and if there's only a small deviation between the model and the true system behavior, this will accumulate over a longer horizon into completely different behavior. And this is clearly an issue if we're talking about technical systems that we want to control, to stabilize, or to, to you know, tune in a way that they behave energy efficiently and so on. So the question that we need to answer here, or the, the approach that we need to do, is the question of feedback. Okay, so how do we feed back information from the system to, you know, account for this inaccuracy, right? And so in contrast to our open loop uh, statement, this is what we will call closed loop control. Right? And so why are we talking about loop and open and closed? So let's draw a little sketch here and see what I mean by this. So we start with our real system. Right? And we are going to call this the plant. This is very common in, in system theory. So this is the real system that we maybe know the dynamics of, maybe we do not even know them. But this is the system that is running in real time. And so what we do, we have seen this sketch a couple of times already, we feed in a control sequence. Right? This is small u would be a matrix, you know, the control dimension times the number of time steps, or big U is, is the same version, just the, the reshape. So this is the input for a given length, maybe just one time step. And then the plant reacts to this input in producing an output. Okay, So we may have our output Y, but for simplicity we may also say that we can observe the entire state X. Okay, So usually you have input to output Y, Let's consider that we maybe in, in this more simple setting can even measure the full state. Okay, so this is what we would call open loop, right? You put something in and you get something out. The response 
that you want to do. And so feedback control or closing this loop means that we have a feedback, okay? So we measure either our observed quantity or the system state itself. And then we connect this to a controller. Okay, so this controller receives the system state or the measurement and takes a control decision, right? So we give back some U, okay? And so mathematically speaking, what this could be is that you decide on your control input as a function, and this is often called pi of x, right, or y, okay? So you have a function that takes in the state and produces a control input. And so this is what we mean by closing the loop or receiving a feedback signal. And in this way, we can account for inaccuracies, right? Whereas we had here our initial state x0 and then had to determine a very long trajectory, we here can update our initial condition, if you wish, and then account for this accuracy by not, you know, looking into the future for infinitely large time steps or infinitely many time steps, but just, you know, taking a decision on a short horizon, maybe one step, and then receiving a feedback that synchronizes our model with the truth. Okay, and so the question is now, why did we call this video model predictive control? Because this is a particular technique to realize this controller, right? So the field of control theory is gigantic and you can have all sorts of things, right? Classical control would mean to try to derive a maybe an algebraic relation between input and output. In deep learning or machine learning, you can try to learn this pi using you know, deep neural networks. Reinforcement learning is a very popular topic in, in this area. Um, and we will talk about, you know, learning-based control approaches also uh, in, in the upcoming videos. But for now, what we want to use is we want to combine our model with this framework. And this is what model predictive control means. So here's the idea um, that we get the solution using our open loop problem. But not once. Instead, repeatedly, okay? So here's the idea, let me sketch a small diagram here. So this is our discrete time, so the time step k. And here we are considering both the system state x and the control input u, right? So both. Um, and what we do now is we start at a given time step. Let's say this is k equals zero at this point. So we have an x zero. And given this, we can now solve our open loop control problem, not for arbitrarily many time steps, or let's say n time steps, but maybe let's call this n p time steps, okay? So for this example, let's simply use n p equal to four. So this is the number of prediction steps that we are going to do in the open loop problem. So we're solving this problem, not over the time horizon of length n, which would be the entire well, time, um, interval that we're interested in, but we're using a subsection of this NP. So this is smaller than our N, which can also be infinity if we're talking about, you know, ongoing processes. And so now we're solving this problem given our initial condition. So we here have our X zero, and then we solve for, we'd have set four, right? Let's just assume that this was our control trajectory. So this was one, Second one maybe in this, so there's a reason why I'm using a, a solid line, a dashed line. Maybe this is the next one, and then maybe this is the next one, okay? And so let's just say our system behavior, this is all model-based now, we're using our model to do this computation. And so what we can do now is we can simulate, right, we have our model at hand, what the system behavior may be, right? And so maybe our system behaves like this. Okay, so this is all open loop. We have received our signal. This was the x zero. 
And then based on this feedback signal, the input here, we have solved our open loop problem. And what we do now is to close the feedback loop, we feed back a input signal, but we are not feeding back our four inputs, but we have a control horizon. This is NC now, which I have set to one. And there's usually less than or equal to NP, right? So in this case, I'm applying the first one to the real system. And so what you see is I now have applied this and then maybe the system does something similar, but not exactly what it's supposed to do, right? Because there's a discrepancy between our model and the plant behavior. So what you may get is something like this. Okay. And so what we can do now is we are here, the plant has, you know, simulated or moved on and we can measure a new time step. Okay. So what we get is we get a new point. This is now our X1, which in this problem serves as our initial condition, right? This is a parametric problem. So we have now a new um, input or parameter here. The initial condition is now our X1, the feedback from the true system. And we can solve once more, okay? So, but now we're not solving for zero to four, but from one to five. We just move the prediction horizon forward in time. So maybe what we get is not this realization because, well, maybe it's not correct anymore. You know, we have overshot a little bit, so maybe the true one would be something like this. And again, I'm using a solid line because this is what we in the end will apply to the system. And then maybe the next one looks like this. Next one may be looking like this. And the fourth one, I don't know, something like this, right? And so now what you get is you get another prediction using the model. So we solve the open loop problem again, um, just with a different parameter, if you wish. And so what you can actually do is you can use very efficient tools from linear algebra to solve this uh, in a parametric parametric parameter dependent way. And so in the end, this is solved very efficiently. So we get a new prediction, which may look like this, okay? So the goal doesn't matter here. Maybe it is to follow a certain reference trajectory, or maybe it's to minimize the energy. So the, 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 the objective that we're trying to pursue here is not visualized. This is just assuming that this is the optimal input and the dash line is the optimal trajectory for our model, right? And then we, re we repeat, okay? So we apply this one now to the true system. And so we get another deviation like this, okay? And so in this way, we close the loop. We repeatedly solve the open loop problem to determine this feedback behavior. And we shift the horizon every time we apply this, okay? This is why this is also called receding horizon control. Um, and it's a very, very efficient method. Um, efficient in the way that we can easily incorporate constraints. We can use nonlinear models as well. This just means that this becomes a nonlinear problem. Um, so super, super useful. Big problem, however, is that we need to solve the control problem in real time. Right? This is the challenge, right? The real system is running and we need to determine the feedback signal in a very, very short amount of time. So MPC, very, very powerful technique, widely used. The challenge is that the real-time um, yeah, well, the, the, the real constraints that you have on solving the problem. And this is why MPC is usually more popular when it comes to linear models instead of nonlinear ones. Okay, so I hope you get the idea. Let's have a look at some code where I will realize this um, on, on the system that we have seen before, okay? So here's some text where the details don't matter all too much. Um, the only thing that I'm doing here is, this is what we have seen before, right? We have our cost function, which depends on X and U. And what I'm doing now to make things a bit more interesting is I'm including a reference trajectory. So you may recognize the system as the one we had before. We had, before we had X transpose Q times X and U transpose R times U, which we have in similar ways now, but I have added a delta here. So what I'm trying to minimize now is the distance between x and a reference trajectory. So it's x minus x ref transposed times q times x minus x ref. And so everything else stays the same. Right? This is subject, right? we have the final 
control cost, so it's on the final terminal constraint. Um, and here we have our linear system, okay? And so this may look a little hairy, but if you go through this um, in, the, in, the, in the code that we will, will provide, you will see that this is actually exactly the same derivation as we had before. So you end up in the end with a, a new formulation where the only difference is that you get this offset in the linear term. Okay, so we again have this quadratic term in U and we have this linear term in U where these parts are the same and this minus X ref, so again a reshaped version of the reference trajectory, this one um, comes uh, in addition and then we have this constant term which when we take the derivative is zero anyway. So you see, very, very similar difference is that we have this reference trajectory. And so taking the derivative will give us this system and you know, this is what we need to solve. So the only thing that changes is that we have this X ref in addition here. And so to get the optimal U star, we need to solve this linear system. So all that you have seen before. And what we're doing now is we're solving this in a repeated fashion, okay? So I'm considering a larger time horizon now, 500 time statements over 0.1 seconds as before. So this is 50 seconds. We start at the initial condition zero. This is exactly as in the video before, our small robot moving in the plane. So rather simple linear dynamical system, uh, four states, two positions, two velocities, and two inputs, you know, the acceleration in, in the x1 and the x2 direction. And so well, all we need to do is now we need to define a reference trajectory. And what I'm doing here is, um, you will see this in, in the image in a second, it's we are driving ellipses for which the radius increases. So we're going basically in you know, circles to, to, you know, to make it more interesting than just steering to the origin. And so what we do now in MPC is um, we implement it like this. We take the, the prediction horizon NP, which I used four here in my, in my little sketch. I'm setting it to 10 here. So in every time step, we are solving a 10 time step length horizon or prediction horizon long open loop problem. And we will then apply the first entry. So NC is going to be one to the plant. So what you see here is we assemble again the G and H and Q hat and our hat matrices exactly as before so that we get you know, this version. And the MPC loop is then as such, you, you increase your K index um, as long as you have not reached the end of your, your entire steps, the, uh, the prediction horizon, this is 500 minus the 10 time steps. And what we do is we take the reference trajectory from time step K to K plus NP, so the reference part that is currently active. And we then simply solve the optimization problem by solving this linear system. So this is the matrix backslash, and this is the right-hand side vector, which is exactly as before, only that we have this X ref now. Okay. And so what we now do is we apply the first entry. We add this to the UMPC trajectory where we collect the data and apply this first entry to the real system, which is now A X plus B U. Okay. And so this is how we close the feedback loop. And so you see the X zero in our system is the X MPC at time step K. So this is how we get the feedback loop in order, right? So instead of the initial condition, we use the current system state as the initial condition. We then increase K and repeat, right? And the rest is just, you know, storing stuff in matrices and this is what we get. Okay, so you see here, the first plot is the state, positions, and velocities, and in dashed lines, the reference um, position. And so, you know, this is a bit crowded maybe, but this is what you see. So the blue line is the system state, and the dashed line is the reference state that we want to track. And so what you can see, actually, we, we achieve perfect tracking over a very large time horizon. And so, and then this is the associated control signal that we get but it's not an open loop problem. This is a concatenation of one entry at a time per MPC loop. And you see that this, in the end, gives us this very, very nice control behavior so that we can follow these ellipses with uh, increasing radius. All right, so I hope this gives you a nice introduction and a good feeling for how model predictive control works. Obviously, there are many, many open questions. Um, what about nonlinear models? What about constraints? What about data-driven models? Um, and so the last question will be addressed in the next video. So thanks a lot for your attention and see you then.